had to go ahead and apologize for not being dressed appropriately to preach. But I told Pastor Bobby, he ta I was talking with him yesterday, and he asked me, he said, can you be on standby? I said, yeah, as long as you know. I said, number one, I can't wear, I don't have a dress shirt I can wear. If I did have a dress shirt I could wear, I couldn't wear a tie, and I know I don't have a sport coat I can wear. He said, well, he said, if anybody's got a problem with it, tell them to take it. And he stopped, and he said, no, don't tell them nothing. So we'll just leave it like that. But uh, uh, just pray my heart would be where it needs to be if my clothing isn't. Um, you know, like I said, Pastor Bobby, oh, yeah, sorry. <coughs> Randy's right there giving me the finger. Go ahead and turn this thing on. There we go. All right. Um, so uh, when Pastor Bobby asked me yesterday, I started looking and studying, you know, what I was going to speak on today, and I prayed about it, and I was uh, led to the book of Obadiah. That's what we were going to look at. Before anybody turn there, that's not what we're going to be. I've got, to, got to tell you this thing. I uh, started studying that. It was uh, it's the shortest book in the Old Testament, and uh, it is about the tribe of uh, Moab, you know, and Mo uh, I'm sorry, Moab, Edom. Edom uh, was came from Esau, and this was uh, Jacob's brother. Just as Jacob had his name changed to Israel, um, Esau had his name changed to Edom, and there was a tribe that came out of there. And God was pronouncing judgment on them during this book because he said what had basically happened is Edom put themselves up on a high mountain, and they were looking down on Israel. And when Israel had any sort of bad favor, uh, especially whenever the Babylonians came and took Israel captive, Edom swept in and not only uh, took what they wanted from Israel, but they also, if there were any refugees left, they were taken captive. And they were, uh, some of them were even killed. And God was proclaiming that, you know, that these people came from the same origins yet had completely diverged on their paths. And um, it was going to be a good message. And something happened today, this morning, and God changed all that. We're actually going to be in Colossians tonight. We're going to be in chapter 3. And instead of hitting an entire book of the Bible tonight, we're just going to look at a few verses that are familiar um, to most of us. But here's the thing. God, in his time that he was gracious enough to spend with me today, and I say that because it was absolutely nothing about me, but God's graciousness to want to spend time with me today. He showed me several things, and I hope that any one of them speaks to somebody tonight. But the first thing that he showed to me was, even though this is a familiar passage of Scripture, the truth of the Word of God never changes. The message of the Word of God never changes. The words of the Word of God never changes, but we change. We may listen and hear and read Scripture time and time and time again, but it may take the Spirit bringing us to a place where suddenly that Scripture means something new to us. Suddenly that Scripture means what God wants it to mean in our lives, and that's what happened today. Um, Basically, what happened is I, I have started at the beginning of the year, decided, I said, okay, I'm tired of messing, you know, having to get somebody to take me to Walmart to pick up prescriptions, so I'm going to do this online pharmacy. And I went with my insurance company and went with the highest one that they recommended, and I went with them, and everything went great um, the first time I got my prescriptions. And so it was time to renew everything, refill them. So I sent them a message get everything refilled. They had everything. They said, we'll fill it tomorrow. It'll be shipped out tomorrow afternoon. I said, great. Well, what happened was this morning, I was uh, fixing snack for Aiden, and I got a phone call from the pharmacy, and they said, we just want to check with you on something. They said, uh, part of your medication, the uh, copay changed. And I said, really? It, it shouldn't have changed. I said, you know, most of the time, the copay changes at the beginning of the year. If something changes, you know, with all that. She said, well, yeah, it did. She said, I want to know if you wanted us to fill it or not. And it's for my pods, the things that I use for my, you know, to my, deliver my insulin. I said, what did it change? She said, well, last time for three months, it was $74. I said, okay. She said, well, this time for three months, 280 That's kind of what I said. 
and I immediately, that game's switch flipped. And I spent about 10 minutes. I said, what do I need, to, what needs to happen? She said, well, the best thing I can do is call your insurance company. I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, if I call my insurance company and they say you, you're wrong and I call you back and I say, hey, they said you're wrong. I said, what's going to happen then? Are y'all going to change it? And she said, well, no, I, we would need to talk to the insurance company. I said, then why don't you call them instead of me playing middleman? I'm just telling y'all, this wasn't the right thing to do. It's just where my mindset's at. She said, yes, sir, I understand. We'll call them. So then I got to thinking about it. I like, maybe they ran something wrong. So I called back, and I got to talking to a lady again. And she said, well, you know, no, we, we've run it through three times, and everything is correct. So I called the insurance company. And the lady told me, and this is something I've never experienced, and apparently a lot of people have, but I have never hit what the insurance calls the donut hole. I'm not sure if any of y'all know what that is, mm -hmm. but I hit it last year in November, so I was expecting, okay, well, I'll probably hit it again this year, and we can save up, and I can have a little bit extra to do that. Nope. Second time I get my prescriptions refilled this year, I'm in it because of the cost of some of my prescriptions. And I said, well, what do I need to do to get out of it? She said, well, right now you pay 400 some dollars out of pocket. I said, okay. I said, all right. I said, what do I need to hit to come out of it? She said, 7,400 for medications. And I could do nothing but just chuckle. And uh, I'm just gonna share with y'all Today, tonight, and I'm being completely honest, and this has a lot to do with the message because it's what God did after this. But I, I do want a participation. I, I will tell you guys what I said, and I want to ask if anything seemed like it was wrong or inappropriate. First of all, I was upset. I said, why didn't somebody let me know so I could have prepared for this? You know, uh, my three-month supply last year, or last time was a total of, and I'm just, Please understand, I'm giving y'all these amounts just because I want you to know where my head was. <coughs> I said I paid $180 last time for three months supply of everything, and this time it's going to be $450. I said, wasn't budgeted for that. Why didn't somebody let me know? Now, do you think I was wrong for asking why somebody didn't let me know? No, I, I don't think I was. And so then I went and I started, asked, I said, you know, this right here is what really bugs me. But she asked me, she said, well, maybe you could talk to your doctor and get a lower cost treatment plan. And I said, ma'am, right, I'll tell you right now, I could go and I could go buy syringes and get my insulin and you know, I'd pay next to nothing. I said, but I'm on a system now, a closed loop system, which means that I basically have an artificial pancreas. I wear a device that tells me exactly what my blood sugar is. It tells this little pod that I wear what my blood sugar is. Then that pod gives me the amount of insulin that I need. And other than taking, having to put in when I eat something, how much I'm eating, it does everything I'm supposed to. It's supposed to. An A1C is what they use to gauge how long or how high your blood sugar has been over an amount of time. Most of my life as a diabetic, it's been above an 8. Sometimes as much as a 12 if I've run through a sickness or something like that but on this i've been down below a seven they want you to be between a seven six something like that almost non-diabetic numbers i said so what really bugs me i said is that your insurance company every year or excuse me yeah every year you send me rewards for staying healthy you send me a $25 gift card from Amazon when I go to the doctor and get my three-month checkup. You send me things all the time wanting me to stay in shape. They'll send you vouchers for up to $150 worth of workout equipment to stay healthy. All these rewards for staying healthy. But I find something that may actually make me live longer and keep me healthy and therefore cut down on what you're going to have to pay. And it's like I'm being penalized for it. That, does that sound like it makes sense? Does that sound like a valid argument? Good. I'm glad it did. Because this lady said one thing to me. And it was like I could hear the Lord speaking through her when she said it. 
And that's what we're going to get into. She said, Mr. Gaines, I completely understand your frustration. She said, but can I just tell you something? I said, yeah. She said, I understand you're frustrated with your insurance company. She said, but <coughs> this medic, or the, she called it medication, but it's my pod. She said, this equipment, she said, if you were to pay for it out of pocket without insurance, it costs $4,000 for a three-month supply. She said, we have a contract that the pharmacy can only charge you $2,300 for this. And you are paying, of course, a, a fraction of what <coughs> the total would be if you didn't have insurance. She said, I understand your frustration. She said, but it could be a whole lot worse. Now that, in the wrong state of mind, would have set me off on an absolute spiral. But like I said, I heard the Lord speak to me when she said that. Because when I got off the phone with her, I got here, here's the thing about it. It wasn't that I didn't have it. It was the frustration, it was the shock, it was the feeling like something had been dumped in my lap all of a sudden. That was what got me. And I wasn't thinking about the fact that this is a $4,000 cost that I didn't have to pay. I was failing to see the blessing through my frustration. I had an anger that was unjustified because I was focused on me. There might be some things I want to do that I might not get to do to keep myself alive. And I was angry about it. I'm going to stop that story right there and I'm going to tell you how the Lord spoke to me through it. We're going to look here in Colossians. And again, in chapter 3, this is something that is going to be very familiar, but I want us to look at it hopefully with fresh eyes. The title of the message tonight is Being an Extremist. Extremist. I guess I should have picked a word I could say. Being an extremist. Pastor Bobby uses that phrase all the time, or he talks about being an extremist. He said that's what we are. We are extremists. We're on one side or the other. You know, there's usually never any middle ground. I'm going to tell you what God spoke to me about today, and this is not contradicting anything Pastor Bobby says, because in most things we do need to be moderate. We do need to be temperate. We need to be one way or another. But is there anything wrong with being an extremist when it comes to worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ? When I said it before, when I was in Bible college, um, we had uh, somebody was talking, somebody would come up with an idea and talk about ministry and things like that. And there was a phrase, and we had one professor in particular that would say the same thing. He's like, yeah, that's great. That's a good idea. But the ordinary Christian, the ordinary churchgoer isn't going to do that. The ordinary parishioner is not going to do that. The ordinary congregation is not going to do that. And we didn't get along because I asked the question, I said, why are we training up men to minister to ordinary Christians? Why are we not training men to minister to extraordinary, extraordinary servants of God? And I don't mean extraordinary as in they've done something great, but they are so devoted to Christ that God can do something tremendous through them extraordinary through them. I think of someone like George Mueller that prayed when his orphanage didn't have anything to eat. He prayed and the next morning there were bags of flour and food out on the doorstep that just so happened that a, something broke down and they had these things. That's what I would call an extremist. Because here's what we do. If we need something and we want something, we pray about it. And when it doesn't come to fruition, we don't think in our heads, well, okay, God didn't want that to happen. What we think is, well, God didn't come through. Let me go by my means now and get what it was I wanted. We never consider that us not getting what we think we need is something that God is doing. If we look here in the scripture, the Bible says in chapter 3, verse 1, 
If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, and I thank you for what you've done in my heart from today. Father, I may not be as um, eloquent as I want to be. I may not be as um, in, in as much remembrance as the things that you and I spoke with to, about today. But Lord, I just pray that you would set me aside and speak through me. I pray this would be, as Miss Lucy said, a message that's hot off the press. I pray it would be something that would uh, bring eternal rewards, Father, for those that hear it, that choose to heed it. Father, it is a choice, um, but Lord, what you speak to me about may not be what you speak to someone else. I just pray, Lord, for each and every person that's here hearing this, for every person that may hear it on video, uh, that may hear a CD of this. Lord, I just pray that you would do what you need to do in their lives and they would be obedient to what you've called them to do through this message. I thank you for the opportunity. Father, I'm sorry that Pastor Bobby's not here, but I just thank you for the tremendous honor of allowing me to be here. And I just pray again, you would just empty me yourself, forgive me for anything that may prevent this from uh, being your word. And thank you for who you are, for all that you've done. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So first of all, we need to see this here. If we then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Are you saved? If you are saved, then you are risen with Christ. So the things that we're going to talk about here are not things, and I've mentioned it before, I go back to when Brother Richie preached that at Chatham Central, or taught that at Chatham Central during Sunday school, that where it said, be filled with the Spirit, it is not a suggestion. It's a command. If there's something in your life that's keeping you from being filled with the Spirit, then it needs to get out of your life. Because the Bible says to be filled with the Spirit. That's God's will for us in our life, because that's how he's going to be able to work. So here it says, if then ye be risen with Christ, then we are to seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. This goes back to what Paul said when Paul said that, you know, um, I just drew a blank. The thing Paul said about the importance of Christ and who Christ was that for, um, yeah, um, uh, uh, sorry, folks. I just I'm confusing uh, John the Baptist. You know, um, basically, I, I'm not remembering who said it real quick, but I do know Christ has got the increase. We have got the decrease. He has got the increase. We have got the decrease. If we are seeking the things which are above, and then it is expressly says where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. We are to be seeking the things of Christ. Now, we want to be moderate in our Christianity. We want to be able to have the things and do the things that we want to do, but we still want to, uh, let's be honest, I don't know that we could say that we honestly want to serve Christ if we knew what serving Christ really meant. We do want the rewards of serving Christ. We want the reward of trusting God. We enjoy, I enjoy, having a church family to come to. To have a church family to, as I did a little while ago, share, and I hate to even call it a burden, because, again, I'm, I'm seeing that what I was so upset about today isn't even a burden. But we have these things, and we have them because we we come to church, you know, we got saved. We have a community here, a congregation that I truly feel is like a family. <coughs> and when we have that, that's what we tend to focus on. We don't tend to focus on seeking the things that are Christ's. We think that coming to church, it is the will of God that we come to church. But that's not the limit of the things of Christ. Being able to sit and read our Bible, to have the freedom to come to a congregation and openly worship, 
That is something that God wants us to do. But that's not the extent of seeking the things that are Christ. That's not the extent of things that are Christ. If we go to verse 2, it says, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Let me ask you this. What is affection? Somebody give me a definition. What is affection? As we would talk about it today. Okay, Ethan said love. That's what I was looking for. I'm glad you said it because that's wrong. No, <laughs> no, no. We uh, here. We need to look at this, and this is why it's so important that we actually are getting into the Word of God and we're doing word studies because Ethan is right. Affection is love, but here, what this is used in this word that is translated, it is the idea of having the same sort of focus on. Now, um, the other word, uh, the other me meaning of it there is not only to have the like a focus on that, but be of the same opinion as. You know, Ethan and I are friends. If I said I have an affection for Ethan, you know, I do love him as a brother in Christ, but in this, what this would mean is Ethan and I agree on the things that Ethan thinks. I have an affection for Ethan. When I'm doing something during the day, I'm going to be thinking, how's this going to affect Ethan? That's what this is saying. To have an affection for someone in this context is to have a focus on, have the same opinion with, and consider that that you have an affection for. And, you know, I, I want us to get this idea, you know, we, we talk about, uh, and I hear people say it sometimes, well, you know, you ought to be able to sit down and read the Bible without having to know Greek or Hebrew or any of the, or Aramaic or any of these other languages. And yes, that's absolutely true. I, there's nothing wrong with using that word here. But we do need to understand that this was translated, and most everybody, if you're using the King James Bible, what, 1611? And we do understand that the, the usage of word changes. You know, if, if I were to say to you a hundred years ago that, you know, that fellow over there, he's, he's, he's a little queer, you know, he, he dresses very gaily. Now, a hundred years from there ago, that was, they, you know, he, he dresses kind of strange, you know, he, he wear, and he, he wears some bright colors. There's nothing wrong with what I said. If I were to say today, that guy over there is a little queer. He, he dresses very gaily. That's going to mean something completely different. And that's in less than 100 years. So that's the importance, I think, of us really getting in here and understanding what, the, what these words really mean in relation to the Scripture. Um, but it says here, if, if we are focused on the things above, set your affection on the things above, not on things of the earth. It also means kind of in a way to, to like I said, to share the opinion of. Now let me ask you this. We know that God hates sin, all right? But yet we know that God loves a sinner. We know that God wants that person to be saved. Is there anything that's in our heart that would be a differing of opinion with God? Of the importance of that soul as opposed to what our opinion is of what the soul is doing. Um, we are not to be unequally yoked with this world. We are not to be, and we'll get into this a little bit when it talks about um, a few of the other words down here in verse 5. But we are not to be falling in with the world. But yet there should be enough of a relationship with those that God puts in our way that we can see them for the soul that God wants to be saved as opposed to what they've got going on in their life. Doesn't mean you approve of it. Doesn't mean you give it your stamp of approval. Doesn't mean you overlook it. But that is what God gives the Holy Spirit for. 
We're simply to share Christ and to show forth Christ in all of our interactions, in everything that we do. As we keep looking here, it says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. This is the verse that made this passage jump out at me. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. We know what it means, and we've heard it said time and time again. I think back to when I believe it was Bobby Robertson, Brother Bobby Robertson, taking Lester Roloff to the, <coughs> to the, <coughs> excuse me, Excuse me. He was taken to the airport, and he said something that he said that he felt like it offended Brother Roloff. And when they got to the airport, he told him, he said, I really, you know, you've all heard this before. He said, I really wanted to, to apologize. I feel like I offended you. And I don't know if you remember what Lester Roloff said. He said, if you offended me, that's my fault, because that means I'm not dead to self. I should be dead to self. If you've offended me, then that is my problem. That's not yours. I need to get that right with God. So we understand what it says, ye are dead, but it says, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Does anybody know what that word there, to be hid, means? I think we probably all think we know what it means to hide something. Um, <laughs> I remember the, uh, the Tuesday after Easter, Aiden came over and he had, uh, Stone had picked him up from school and I think he had brought a, um, uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we picked him up and he had an Easter basket with him and it had all these little eggs and everything. And Aiden wanted to make a little fort and we had a recliner in the living room and he popped that recliner up and he got a blanket, and I think Suzanne and Stone helped him, and he had him a little fort there under there, and he was in there, and I saw him a few minutes later. You know, I spent a lot of time with him during the day and have, and I saw him jump out of that little fort, and he took his tablet in there, and then he came out again. He grabbed that Easter basket, and he went running back under the fort, and he got real quiet, and we're sitting there, and we're sitting there, and I nudged Suzanne, and I said, I think he's sitting up there eating his candy. She said, I don't think there's any candy in there. I said, Aiden. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, I mean, it looked like confetti under there. That youngin had to be unwrapping three for every two that he ate. But he likes to, you know, if he thinks it's, it was like most of us, if he thinks it's questionable, he's going to hide before he does it. Instead of just being open. That's not the meaning of hiding right here. What it says here to hide is to keep secret. I like this. It says to hide, to conceal, to be hid, to conceal that which may not become known. But this is the one I really like. It also, the main meaning is to escape notice. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Let me ask you something. How many of you have met somebody new since you've been a Christian? Pretty much all of us. Can the people that you've met, can they say that they know more about the Lord Jesus from knowing you, or they know more about you from knowing you? Our life is to be hidden, to escape notice. I go back to, uh, I've read it several times, but the, uh, the, the man, St. Patrick, um, the prayer, I've read it before, and I'll probably do it again. I bring it up every once in a while, a prayer. They said he used to pray, uh, pray every morning. And part of it, it was when people hear me, I pray they hear Christ. When people see me, I pray they see Christ. When people think about me, I pray they think about Christ. That's what I'm talking about when it mean, when I mean to be an extremist. Because we say, but I, I've got to do this. I, I, I've got to do this. I've got to do these other things. 
What is it in your life that you have that is worth keeping that we are not willing to trust God with? What is it that God, if he wants you to have it, can't give it to you? If he wants you to keep it, he can't secure it in your life that you say, okay, if God, if you're not willing to give it to me or to keep it with me, then I'm going to need to step out and do things on my own, and I need to get the focus on me. You know, uh, almost everybody in here, you know, some of the younger people, but almost everybody in here uh, is a parent. Or, you know, you have parents. When I'm talking about an extremist, would you think it's an extreme thing of, of saying that you would be willing to know that if, for your child to be saved and to go on and live the life that God has for them, you would be willing to let them move away and you never set eyes on them again? Does that sound like an extreme way of thinking? Is there anybody that could raise God? I'll be honest with you, I, I'm not, I don't know I can do it. This is what God's showing me, though. For the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ through your child and for the benefit of your child being a sold-out servant of God, you would be willing to say goodbye to him and never lay eyes on him again. This side of glory. Most of us would, and you would, and somebody would say, man, that's crazy. That's crazy. Who would ever say that? Let's, let's go back to Abraham. Let's go back to Abraham. That mentality is an extreme mentality. But what does God do with a man that has that extreme of a mentality? As Brother Richie taught in Children's Church, for three days, it took them to get from home to the mountain. And Abraham knew when he got there, he was going to sacrifice Isaac. There was no, we're on the other side of it. But to Abraham, he was going to go and kill his son. And it wasn't a snap judgment. He had three days to think about it while seeing his son and talking to his son, and loving his son face to face. He had three days to think about it. He got up there, and he went through everything, and it wasn't that, don't get the wrong idea, he wasn't there with a knife going, no. He was going to strike the blow that would take the life of his child. And it came down to him having the faith in God. That he knew that losing his son here on this earth in obedience to a holy God was going to be something on the other side of that greater than having that boy every day. What is it? If we're talking about a child that God gives us that incredible example of being willing to give up. Not to give up for, for foolishness, not saying that, oh, for them to go off and do this, or, but having the faith in God. And again, this is nothing about Isaac's willingness. It was nothing about Abraham's desire. It's about knowing and having the faith of the love of God. That well, There's nothing you can lose that is going to be anywhere close to what you receive on the other side of it. That's an extremist way of thinking. Is I'm, I'm, I'm setting my focus on what's above. What is it in heaven that we should be focused on other than the Lord Jesus? Nothing. I told you before, I've asked that question to the young people. I heard it asked one time, it's like, if you knew heaven was going to be you living forever, sin-free, sickness-free, surrounded by the, your best friends and loved ones, 
and you were going to be living in the largest mansion, and you were going to be driving the nicest car, and you were going to have all the food and the nicest food you could ever eat, and you would never want for anything, and you were to live in eternity in complete bliss. But the Lord Jesus was not going to be there. Would you still want to go? And we don't know how to answer that. Because we don't put those things of love and joy and bliss in eternity together with the Lord Jesus Christ because we don't see that in him here. That's why we're not willing to focus on the things above. We're focused on the things that we want, the things that we feel like we need to hold on to. That's an extremist way of thinking. And going back to what they said in school, the average Christian isn't going to think like that. That's why we have below average churches. The average congregation isn't going to pray that way or go along that way. Well, look around and what influence or good is the today's church having not only here but in this world. I say here, talk about in this country, but in this world. What what are we having? Because well Something radical like this, we see it in the Bible, and it's not a suggestion, but yet we are, eh, nobody's going to do that. And we know nobody else is going to do it, so we know, we know nobody else would do it. We know how we would look at them if they did, so we're not willing to do it ourselves. Somebody's going to have to say, yeah, like Isaiah, send me. It'll be me. I'll do it. I'll stop worrying about and having an opinion on the things right here. If you took a political situation in this world, whether it's England about to crown a new king, whether it was an election coming up here, whether it was a dictator down in Venezuela, if those things, if the Lord Jesus was standing right here in front of you and you came to him and said, what do you think, what do you think about that? Do you think he would have an opinion on it? Because let's be honest, that's kind of what happened whenever they said, hey, do you think we ought to be ta paying taxes to Rome or not? Do you think we ought to be paying taxes to them? And what did Jesus do? He said, show me a coin. Somebody showed him a coin. He said, who's on it? They said, Caesar. He said, well, render unto Caesar what Caesar's, render unto God what's God. The things that we see around us are the things that belong to this world. You are what belongs to God. Render to God what's God's. It says in verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So this is an answer to the people that's like, Oh, so you want me to go through my entire life and just have nothing for myself and never consider myself and have no happiness and no joy here on this world? You want me to just basically live like a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, well, we would call it somebody sold out, but somebody that was like a, um, I'm, well, an extremist. <laughs> Forgot my own word there. You know, I, I should live like a zealot or an extremist. How long does Paul say this life on this world, or, this wor earth world? How long does Paul say this life lasts in the measure and the span of eternity? He says it's like a vapor. It's like the blowing out of a candle, the vapor that comes up and it disperses and you can't see it anymore. That's what this life is like. But, so what do you get by living and, and going by this extremist idea? <laughs> the Bible says, when Christ, who is our life, and notice there real quick, uh, is there anything special about the words there? Who is? Anybody see anything different about that? Are they in italics in anybody else's Bible? Mm -hmm. So let's let's we know those were added for the ease of reading. Let's take it out. When Christ, our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear also 
with him, uh, excuse me, that there shall ye also appear with him in glory. You are not going to be invisible for eternity. Now, here's the thing about it. When this is talking about, you're not going to care if you're visible or not. You're not going to want to be visible because the Bible says when Christ comes back in his glory, then we will appear with him. And that's when we get our glory. Let me ask you, what is more important? What is going to be more rewarding? What is going to be more fulfilling? A life full of what you want now or appearing with Christ in his glory, not yours. It goes back again. Whose glory are we seeking? Ours or are we seeking Christ? As we continue looking in verse 5, he gives us some instructions. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. And we know what mortify means. Um, you know, similar to the word mortician. Someone that deals with dead things. We are to kill these things in our life. It says here fornication. Now we know that fornication, the difference between adultery and fornication is, um, you know, a, a, a married person in some sort of a sexual uh, sin would be committing adultery. Someone that wasn't married and is just out here committing sexual sin is committing fornication. But, you know, in the Old Testament, this word was used a lot, but it was rarely used in any sort of a sexual connotation. What it was talking about is the people of Israel that would then join themselves together in an intimate way, not necessarily sensual or sexual, but would join themselves together in ideas or opinions with those that were not Israelites. The idea here is you, as a Christian, who is a blood-bought believer, born again, doing what it said, not having your affection on the things above, not hiding your life or having your life to be non-noticed, but the idea that you are yoking yourself together so much with the things of this world and having an opinion on the things of this world that are not going to change one way or another. You know, I, I, I've, I've said it before, and this is an extreme thing to say and an extreme way of thinking, but I believe that if the Lord Jesus came in a lot of modern churches today and was asking people what was important to them, I think a lot of people would say, you know, well, th this country, save this country. Uh, bring this country out of what it is. Do, do away with these sins that are besetting us on each side. And I honestly believe that if that were to happen, it would be the same response that Peter got when Jesus said he was going to be crucified. And Peter said, no, that can't happen. Don't go. And what did Jesus respond to him? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. This world is going to get worse and worse. And we do not have the faith in God that God can draw those in the worst things get. If you think about the things, the idea of a house on fire, if you're sitting in a house or someone's sitting in a house and they smell smoke, are they necessarily going to get up and run out of the house. No. They're going to sit there and they're probably going to try to find the smoke and then if they find a small fire, they're going to try to save it. They're going to try to save their house. But let's say all of a sudden, oh, well, now, now it's no longer smoke. Now it's come up into a flame. Now it's come up into, okay, now what's going to happen? Well, now I'm going to go get some water and I'm going to try to put it out. But then it hits the curtains and it runs up the curtains and now it's in the ceiling. Okay, well, now I'm going to call 911, and I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to try to tell them what's going on. The hotter and the more that house falls apart, the more imperative it is going to be for people to recognize the danger and get out. We are to be the ones standing there going, you don't have to stay here and burn in this. You can get out. 
Now, people got the choice whether to follow you or not. We can't drag someone out kicking and screaming. They've got to come out on their own. But we are to be telling people, you don't have to stand here in this. But the Holy Spirit is the one that is going to show them that, hey, look around you. It's on fire. This is not survivable. I've got a way out. And it's the Lord Jesus. And then they may put you in that person's path. But things have got to get worse before people are going to come to Christ. It is, it is a miracle and a blessing of God for someone young. I think of Susanna that was saved at a very young age. And I think it was D.L. Moody used to say, someone young like that that gets saved, that's not just a salvation of a soul, but it's a life that's saved. You know, she, if she keeps a good head on her shoulders and trusts in God and let him lead God and direct her, she will never have to experience any of the things that a lot of us have and the mistakes that we've made. Um, but it's got choices that's got to be made. If we go to look at the next one, uncleanness, we know what that is. Inordinate affection. And that's basically the same as the next one. Um, well, it's giving too much affection to the things that don't matter. The things that don't matter. Which is pretty much the things that we see and the things that we concern are with on a daily basis. Evil concupiscence. <coughs> concupiscence is basically a fondness for a fondness for. So it goes also back to the idea of having a fondness for something that God would consider evil. Now, it may not look evil. It may not be evil by today's standards. But if God says it's evil, if it, let me back that up. God is going to say it's evil if it's something that is taking your focus away from the Lord Jesus Christ and we see there the, the uh, last one, covetousness, which is idolatry. If we look at that entire verse there, verse 5, instead of looking at, at it as all these different things, it basically goes back to the one of idolatry. And what is the idol? What is the idol? We are. If you have these things in your life, you are the idol that you're worshiping. Because all these things are things that are going to come out of your heart as desires, and when you give in to them, when you give in to them, you're worshiping the self. I was talking with someone the other day about the sin of abortion. And... Um, we were talking about, you know, you call it murder, you call it all these different things. And I said, you know, the one thing that I got thinking about is it's basically child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. And I said, well, you know, how, how is it child sacrifice? Most of the time when it's child sacrifice, it's you're offering a, a, a sacrifice to a God. Well, abortion is too. Is child sacrifice and you're worshiping yourself. The person that commits that is worshiping themselves. They're sacrificing the life of this child for their own whatever that they convince themselves that that's the best idea. Um, but look at that verse 5 is seeing that as ultimately it's, it's idolatry with yourself as the idol. And verse 6, it says, For which things say are the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, um, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. So God is recognizing that we have these things in our heart. He's recognized that, you know, before we were saved, we lived in these things full blown, but I think we can look around, and when I say the church, I'm not talking about the Congregation of Faith Baptist, but we can look at the, the Christian world today and say that most people are still suffering from a lot of these things in their lives as Christians that are attempting to live a life for God because we've not gotten extreme enough with how far we're willing to go in God's worship. And so he says in verse 8, he gives us an answer. He says, but now ye also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication 
out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man and his deeds. So he's telling us these things right here. They are going to come from the things in verse 5. Now let me ask you. If the focus of your life is on the things above, and we've established from this passage of Scripture that the one thing above we should focus on is the Lord Jesus Christ. To the fullest extent of him and his opinion and his wants and what he desires for our life is more important than us even being known. Okay? That's the level that this scripture is talking about. How many of these things, if you're focused on the Lord Jesus, what is it about the Lord Jesus that is going to make you angry? What is it about him that's going to make you angry? What is it about the Lord Jesus that's going to bring forth your wrath? To make you wroth in your mind to where you get you know, anger is one thing. Wrath, in my mind, is the idea of I've got to put this anger into action. I've got to do something with this anger so someone knows how angry I am. What is it about the Lord Jesus that would cause you to be in malice and, you know, to have maliciously? Maliciously means you do something with the full intent of knowing that it's going to cause harm to someone or something. What is it that you can focus on the Lord Jesus and then have malice in your heart? What is it about God and the Lord Jesus that's going to cause you to blaspheme? What is it about worshiping God and focusing on him and the Lord Jesus Christ that is going to cause filthy communication to come out of your mouth? What is it about worshiping the Lord Jesus that will cause you to lie one to another? And what is a lie? You know, we want to go up and classify them. You know, here's an extreme thing. Here's an extreme thing. I've talked to the young people about this. And someone would say, oh, man, you're just going too far. Let's say somebody came to you and said, hey, we're going to throw a surprise party for so-and-so. Do you want to come? Sure, I'd be glad to come to it going to be Saturday. All right? Great. And then that person that's having the birthday comes up and goes, hey, are they going to throw a party for me? What's your answer going to be? They ask me, what's your answer going to be? Now, we would say, well, of course you're not going to tell them about the party. Can you tell me how that's not a lie? That's what I like to call a justifiable lie. Because, first of all, you would think, well, man, it, this could ruin a whole bunch of friendships and this could ruin a whole bunch of stuff if I told the truth. But what's more important? And I'm, I'm being honest. That is an absolute extreme way of thinking. Because, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to, you, I mean, it, you can't unhear it. If someone says, hey, we're throwing a party for so-and-so, now what are you going to do? I'm, I'm not going to go talk to them and all these things, but we agree that, well, that's an acceptable lie. That's okay. But I don't see any footnotes where it says not to lie to one another. So how extreme are we willing to be in order to serve the Lord Jesus? And the last thing there in verse 10, it says, oh, it was finished there. It says, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. When we got saved, the Bible is clear. We became a new man. We are a new creature in Christ. How many of us can agree with that? Okay, I think most everybody can. Young people know, raise your hand when I get it wrong. Here's the problem. 
We are a new creature in Christ. The problem is the world's not met that creature. We've kept the new creature in Christ hidden behind the person that we were before because we like them. We're holding on to them. We are a new creature wearing an old man's disguise. And we have yet to introduce the world to that new creature. How many of us would be willing tomorrow to go into our jobs, go into our relationships, and be honest and say, you know what? I got saved whenever I got saved, and God made me somebody new. But you know what? I brought a whole lot of baggage with me. As of today, I want you to know that I'm not the person that I was yesterday. I'm somebody new. You may like me and you may not, but I know that the Lord Jesus loves me and that's going to have to be okay. To finish up, the last part of the story I was telling earlier, when that lady told me, she said, you know, Mr. Gaines, I understand it's frustrating, but I want you to understand that the total cost of this med or this device is $4,000. We limit how much you have to pay where you only have to pay $2,300. Or they, they can only charge you $2,300. And out of that $2,300, you only have to pay $280. And if God spoke to me today, I could hear him saying, living for yourself is going to cost hell. That's, that's the total cost of living for yourself. But you know what? You don't have to pay that. I gave you my son, and he paid that. And instead of saying, but you've got a copay of this, no, I don't have anything that I owe. As Paul said, it is our reasonable service to present our bodies a living sacrifice. So to put it in the terms of what she said to me, the cost of you is hell. It's been paid for you 100%. And all I ask for is your love and your obedience. Now, where do I have the right to be frustrated that I'm not getting what I want. And I'll leave you all that tonight. Let's pray. Father, I do ask now, Lord, that you would just help me to be the person that I need to be. Lord, Father, help me to be the man that you made me when I got saved. Father, I just pray that whatever I said tonight, Lord, out of your word, would have a um, uh, something in someone's heart tonight, Lord, that, again, that would have eternal rewards, not for my glory, but completely and totally for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help me to be who and what I need to be. I pray for this church. I pray for those that are hearing it, whether it, again, it be on video or on CD. Lord, I just pray that you would do with the message what you would. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the preservation of your word. And we ask these things in the name of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all.